Good morning, everyone. She was asleep this whole time and then comes out as soon as I go live, of course. Um, good morning, everyone. Okay, so today we're talking about if you're eating right, you're exercising, but you're not losing weight or you're gaining weight or you're plateauing or whatever it might be, what is going on? Like, why is that happening? What's going on in the body that's causing this? Um, there's really five main things that I've seen that come up really consistently with the A and peeps or with a lot of clients of mine. Um, and they're all pretty different on, on what's actually happening. So I wanted to go through each of the, those with you guys today, especially because today marks the start of the fourth week of the spring intermittent fasting challenge. So um, especially if you over the last three weeks, maybe you experienced some weight loss in the beginning, but now you're starting to plateau. It's a lot of really great information to use to further tailor this whole protocol to your goals. Um, but first, keto coffee cheers, guys. I actually made sure I had enough for this morning too. Lots of people in chat already. Good morning, Mary. Hi, Heather. Oh, good morning, Camille, Monica, Skills Many, Christina, Darla, Arena. All right. Lots of people in the chat. Okay. Um, so you guys know who I am. Autumn, certified clinical nutritionist, master's nutrition, human performance, that whole spiel. Um, but today, like I mentioned, we're going to be going over what it is that could be happening for why it is that you're eating healthy, but not losing weight, um, even if you are exercising. And unfortunately, this is something that I see happen a lot where a lot of us are you know, really trying hard to achieve a weight loss goal, feel good again. But even though you're incorporating possibly all the right things, you're not seeing results. Um, and again, it really comes down to, a, you know, really, there's a lot more, but the five or some key ones that I've seen in the past. Um, good morning, keto coffee. Cheers. Oh, from Germany. Awesome. Okay. So let's jump straight into that first one, which just as a reminder, this is the fourth and last live stream for the challenge. I will be doing more live streams for the summer challenge and then the monthly live streams as well. This is the last weekly one until the summer challenge, which lots of really, really fun, exciting things going on for that one that I've been planning like this whole year for. So very excited. Um, but before we even like jump three months ahead in time, let's jump straight into that first main reason why you're probably not losing weight. And I actually switched these around a bit because I realized that this one is a really big one for a lot of people. And that's having a lot of these fake sugars or keto treats, or even just having them fairly consistently. I was actually just talking with one of my clients and AM peeps about, about this exact topic because it's crazy how you guys have probably seen just how many of these like keto low sugar treats um, there are on the market right now that are you know being advertised as like no sugar. And so they're good for you. And it's something that's in line with your goals. It's really reminiscent to me of like the low fat days where it would put like low fat on like a candy bar. And so you would assume that it's like good for you because it's low fat. I've seen this happen a lot with um, with like a lot of these keto treats, too. Um, or even not keto treats, but just like keto alternatives. So um, with a lot of these like fake sugar keto treats, they often have things like stevia, monk fruit, various sugar alcohols, erythritol. And even though a lot of scientific literature is coming with mixed results on how it actually affects the body, um, some say that it has an insulin response, whereas others don't. And if you guys have been watching my channel for a while, you know, insulin is the storing hormone. So anything that has that insulin response can turn off fat burning. But from what I've seen just with my clients with the AM peeps, as soon as they take a lot of those sneaky keto treat items or, or zero sugar items out, they see nearly instantly about five to 10 pounds of weight loss. Is it water weight? Is it um, from an insulin response? No way to really tell, but I have seen that's a huge plateau breaker for a lot of people when they actually take out these you know, fake sweeteners or um, keto treats. Uh, there's things like you guys probably seen like the keto cereals where they um, they're like $11 a box, which mind blowing to me that you, you know, would spend $11 on a, another essentially just like junk food item. Um, but it's a lot of those types of treats where it can seem like a healthier alternative or one that will be in line with your goals because it is low sugar. But it really just time and time again, I've seen it as something that can really hold back progress or even start um, reversing the progress. So that's the first main one. Let's see, was there anything else I want to say about that was the main thing. I actually have a video coming out um, next week, I think, 
with Katie's story where she talks about her experience of removing all of those like keto treats and keto sweeteners and how she saw a huge change. And really, this is something I see with all my clients as well. Um, not to say you can't have them on the occasion, not to say that it's not better than the sugar alternative, like real sugar alternative, but it's still something that's a treat and can still hold back progress because of the possibility of an insulin response. <laughs> so Denise says, funny, I'm listening to this while shopping at Costco, large amounts of keto labels here. Yeah. Um, so if you actually look up on like uh, Google Analytics or, or one of those, I forget what it is. If you look up like keto food or keto items, it's like flatlined for a long time and then all of a sudden just explodes. <laughs> um, now it's like one of the top things that people are looking for, which I get it because it does keep insulin levels low. But unfortunately, just like with the low, low fat food items, it can be really tricky. So a lot of tricky um, marketing labels going on here where it's ultimately still not going to serve your goals. Okay. Morning, Sophie. Yeah, I think, she, I think she went back to bed, so she won't be jumping in the frame now. All right. Can you have your keto coffee while fasting? I do have a video on that. So Cynthia asked, can you have your keto coffee while fasting? Um, there's a couple just things to consider with keto coffee. This is kind of like aside from what we're talking about right now. Um, but keto coffee is really great for beginners to especially transition from a, a snacking all day approach to having um, more of a meal structure in a fasting period. So it helps keep you satiated and satisfied without spiking your insulin level during that fasted state. But if you're looking for more of the gut healing and migrating motor complex stimulation, like if you have a lot of gut healing to do, then you'll want to either keep your coffee during your um, eating window or just not have anything at all um, during that fasting state. So just water during that time. L Fox, love your kitchen. Thank you so much. I'm obsessed with it as well. <laughs> okay. Um, so just a reminder as well, I'm going to be answering questions throughout just if you can. So I already see somebody put the four question marks on there. Put four question marks before and after your question, just so it's easier for me to go through it and make sure I can find all of your um, questions so I can answer them. Um, you know, Nicole asked a great question. I think this is something that I'll want to do more of a full video on because I've seen this come up a lot. She said, what is your opinion of the speed or rate that we should be eating a meal? There is there. That is a big factor um, on how quickly your body will absorb the gl glucose from um, your food and in, into the blood supply. You know, if you're more insulin resistant or if you have higher resting insulin levels, um, then that's where you wouldn't want something that's easy to break down. Like, you know, like a smoothie, for example, I've done a video on the times that you wouldn't want a smoothie. And that's because it's already pre-digested, essentially. Um, so if you have like insulin resistance, it might not be a good option for you because it's going to you know be absorbed a lot quicker. But if, if you're eating like a, a regular meal where you have to chew it, generally, that's already going to slow down the process a lot. So you shouldn't be as concerned to you know, make sure you can breathe while you're eating, of course. Uh, but you don't need to be as concerned with like a true meal, um, especially if you don't have insulin resistance. OK, I want to. So is Truvia monk fruit OK to use? Um, that goes back to what we were just talking about. So that's one of the first main problems I see with um, not achieving weight loss goals is the consistent use of stevia, monk fruit, erythritol, um, all of those zero calorie sugar sweeteners that can still cause an insulin response for some people. Um, I see that Katie is on here as well. So I will actually be um, sharing the video with Katie where I interview her on her experience with removing those you know, zero calorie sweeteners and how life-changing it was. Um, but it is something that a lot of people just rely too heavily on to tame a sweet tooth that it actually can make the sweet tooth worse. Um, just really a negative cycle from there. Okay. Um, so the next one, this one I actually drew a little graph for um, because I wasn't able to find the original graph to print it out. But eventually I'm going to get tech savvy enough for these lives where I can like share my screen and show you what I'm looking at. But I wasn't able to print this. So You'll have to bear with my drawings. But this second one is eating above your personal carbohydrate threshold. So it's something that I talk about a lot in the videos is this idea of carbohydrate sensitivity. You know, the, one of the main theories with weight loss, weight gain on why some people can have higher amounts of carbohydrates than others and achieve a weight loss goal still is because of their own insulin response to those carbohydrates. So in order to break this down, here's my graph. Um, I'm not sure if this is flipped for you guys, 
But what they, this is actually from a study back in like the 1990s, um, a couple of newer books on the, on the topic of insulin have been coming out and this has been referenced quite a bit, but it's this idea. So if we have fat, how much fat is bring, being broken down with up here being the highest and how much insulin the body has in its blood supply, you can see that even a small amount of insulin, a small change in insulin causes essentially a switch to be turned off or fat burning. So for each person, um, we all have essentially this, because this study was done in, um, and I, I believe it's like lean college age individuals. So it wasn't even in those who you know, were in a weight loss um, type of regimen or you know, who were obese. This was in lean, healthy individuals. And so this is something that's very common. But what we can see is that this change, what the amount of insulin, so that just means insulin concentration in the blood, um, from here to here is going to be different for each person for the amount of carbohydrates it takes to get that off switch. So to turn off the fat burning process, for some people, the amount of carbohydrates needed to get to that insulin level is going to be higher, whereas for some other people, it's going to be lower. So there's something I talk a lot about in the um, advanced weight loss strategies in the complete intermittent fasting bundle. So this is where, if especially if you have um, more insulin resistance, if you have higher insulin levels, um, then that's where you'd want to go check out a lot of those protocols. They're more specific to that. So you can make sure you can test out your carbohydrate threshold. Um, but this is why some people can slightly lower, you know, just remove things like pasta, remove things like bread, the obvious offenders for hugely spiking insulin levels, or of course, things like soda and see a significant amount of weight loss because that's all they needed to get their um, insulin levels low enough to get that on switch for the fat burning turned on. So from maybe like there to there to get straight up. Whereas other people in order to get to that threshold might need to you know, then cut out things like a sweet potato, something that would be a healthier starchy carbohydrate, but might just put them over the edge for that insulin threshold. Um, there's actually some really great researchers for those of you guys who are more interested in like diving into a lot of these specifics. Um, Bickman is one really popular guy who like pretty much solely researches insulin. Um, he's really, really great information um, from more of the research perspective, goes into like coupling and, and things like that. So really for more of that really research minded person, but otherwise, like if you you can just understand this concept of how we just need to get the insulin threshold or, or get to that insulin threshold where the body is turning on that fat burning process again. Um, that's one big area that I see as well. And that's where it's a lot of variability, a lot of changes for each person um, where it's not necessarily going to be the same for me as it is for someone else or another person. So again, this is something that goes way more in detail for the AMP. Um, you have the complete intermittent fasting bundle, which is also listed down in the description below. This is exactly what the advanced weight loss strategies um, protocol was you know, constructed for and built for so that you could find that threshold. But yeah, this is where another mistake I see is that people might decrease the carbohydrates, but they're not replacing it with fat. It's kind of like a subcategory of this second um, tip here. If you aren't replacing those carbohydrates, those starchy carbohydrates like sweet potato, some type of fat, then the body doesn't really have a fuel source to be pulling from. It's It needs to be using either fat or carbohydrates. Those are its two main fuel sources. We don't really use protein as a fuel source. It doesn't want to use protein as a fuel, fuel source. We just want to really use that for um, creating hormones, for creating muscles and muscle repair but it will start to use um, protein and convert it into carbohydrates via a process called gluconeogenesis, um, something I talked a lot more about in my earlier videos. Um, so if you're not replacing those, those uh, starchy carbohydrates with high quality fats, not only do you risk um, starting to convert protein into carbohydrates, but you also are gonna be hungry. Remember, we need both protein and fat to stimulate those satiety hormones. Um, so it's kind of a lot, that we just talked about with the personal carbohydrate threshold, but remember the advanced weight loss strategies in the complete intermittent fasting bundle, which is linked down in the description below, addresses this exact concept. Um, and if you wanna learn more about like the actual science behind this little handwritten graph that I did, I, tr I tried to print it out this morning, but I should have done it on Friday instead of rushing to do it this morning. Um, but yeah, I, I thought it came out pretty well. Some straight lines-ish. Um, but Bickman is a, a really great researcher going into um, more of the science behind insulin and the impact insulin has on fat loss and, um, and weight gain. 
So that's for my more very research minded people if you want to check that out. Otherwise, advanced weight loss strategy is really great option for the actual protocols to go about that. Okay. I just like went on such a rant that I need another sip of coffee. Okay, Connor's asking a great, great question. Uh, do you need to get lean before adding more fat to your diet? No, <laughs> absolutely not. In fact, um, that kind of goes back to exactly what I was just saying is that you need to be eating fat in order for your body to be burning fat. Otherwise, you run out, run the risk of starting to then convert the proteins into carbohydrates. Um, so you still want to be making sure that you're eating fat to get the satiety and get the body actually utilizing fat as fuel. Um, that is another good question. So that second bump right here, um, as you can see, it's not really that high of a bump when it comes to how much fat is being used. It's I'm not quite sure on the mechanism behind this. I don't think they were quite sure on what was going on with this second bump. I just wanted to be more true to what the graph was representing. The big takeaway definitely is this huge decrease. So there is a, a slight bump here, um, but a huge decrease from, from that one small um, amount of insulin. Okay, I'm gonna try and answer another question real quick. Monica is saying, I like Chuvani for my protein powder. It seems pretty clean with only five or six ingredients, but it does use monk fruit as a sweetener. Yeah, a lot are going to either use um, monk fruit or even like sugar cane. Uh, monk fruit is one of the more common zero um, calorie sweeteners or zero sugar sweeteners that will be used in a lot of these like protein powders. It, again, it just depends on your own sensitivity to these. Like I mentioned, some people don't have an insulin response. This goes back to the first um, thing I talked about in this live stream, by the way, if you're just joining in right now on how having too many fake sugars can also cause a plateau or even weight gain. Um, I would be more if that's if that's the one area that you're using for some type of sweetener, that shouldn't be a problem. It's more that I've seen it happen where you know, it pops up in all meals. So like those uh, sweeteners are used all throughout the day. If you want to experiment with just a completely the natural flavored um, you know, protein powders, which there are some really high quality ones, Biochem is one of my personal uh, favorites. It's also a pretty free of um, heavy metal brand too. Um, but you could experiment with re removing those as well and just using the natural protein powders if that's like the last one that you have in your diet, uh, just to see how your body responds. Okay. Uh, should I? I'm going to answer one more question. <laughs> Adriana. Hi, Autumn. Thanks for this content. You're welcome. Keto coffee. Cheers. Okay. Yeah. So um, I kind of went over that one already on the insulin switch. Yeah. Oh yeah. Katie just weighed in on this. Yes. I definitely had a swap for an unsweetened protein for 30 days and I was shocked at the change. So, <clears throat> so Katie is the one that I interviewed for the channel, um, coming out. What's today? I think it's coming out next week. So look out for that one for just to see how it actually affects, um, a person like a real live person, not just a study, um, with the removal of a lot of these non-nutritive or zero calorie sweeteners. How do I spell the protein that I like? It's literally like biochemistry. So, but biochem, um, so B I O C A G M. And it's, they have like a couple different options. I'd recommend going for the way, the organic grass fed way option they have, the natural option that is the one that was actually tested to be very, 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 very low, if not free of heavy metals. I can't vouch for their other products because the other products I haven't seen a test for, but at least their way one has. Okay. Um, I see some things in, in sleep about here, which that, that's coming up. You're reading my mind. <laughs> um, but let's get into this third reason. So third reason is that you could be gaining muscle. 
And this is actually something that is a lot more common than you would think. Um, there's actually something in, or it's one of the A and Peep shared this in the Facebook group. She shared a, an in-body scan, which an in-body scan is one of the better ways to measure your body fat percentage and your muscle mass and, and how the, those distribute throughout your body. Um, a lot of personal trainers will use it so they can see like, oh, you only have seven pounds of muscle in your left arm and nine pounds in your right. We need to even that out and um, put a little bit more weight on your left. But you can use this also to actually see the changes, the total changes in muscle mass um, as well as body fat. And she had been doing the 21 day intermittent fasting um, program as well as the um, seven day IF detox first, I believe. And um, she saw, she took a baseline in body and then another one about three weeks later. And even though there was no change in her weight, she saw that her body fat had gone down in that time and muscle mass had gone up. So even though the scale would have shown that there's no change, so she would think that this isn't working, nothing great is happening. She was able to see that there's actually this change going on where muscle mass is going up, which is exactly what you want. We want muscle mass to be going up, especially if you are exercising. That's like literally the whole point. Um, and then body fat was going down. So it's body recomposition. That also goes back to a lot of those um, getting enough protein for your needs, incorporating fasting that helps to increase growth hormone, protect the muscles from breakdown. So I definitely recommend if you have the ability to that you would check out um, an in-body scan or, or reading. A lot of gyms or doctor's offices, mostly gyms, though, will have this. So there are like the calipers. There are like the other methods of testing out um, your body fat. But I would recommend this printout version because it gives you a lot of information. It's called in-body, I-N-B-O-D-Y. There are the at-home options, but notoriously unreliable. I mean, I have one at my house as well, just to like kind of see trends, but it's not going to show you these like hyper specific numbers. So if you have access to it, check out your local gym, call them out and see um, if they have one of these available to you and get a baseline, which just in science means like your first reading. So you can have something to compare to you. And then in, you know, every three weeks or every month, depending on um, where you're at in your wellness and weight loss journey, you can then retest and see how those changes are going. Because if you aren't seeing a change in the scale, but you're seeing that your body fat is going down and muscle mass is going up, that's showing that your body is becoming metabolically healthier anyway. And you are making progress in that right direction. Okay. I'm going to go through and answer another question before this next one. I think that may, actually, there's one more thing I wanted to say about the gaining muscle one too. Um, Remember, intermittent fasting does help to stimulate growth hormone. That's something that's been found consistently in a lot of different studies. But you need to be exercising to be getting that stimulus in muscle growth as well. Um, so this gaining muscle concept on if you uh, might be gaining muscle while losing body fat really comes down to if you are actually exercising. Because the body won't just spontaneously form muscle. Muscle is really metabolically expensive, which just means it costs a lot of energy for the body to make and maintain. So unless it sees a need for it through something like exercise, it's not going to actually start to um, incorporate more or more muscle, create new muscle in the process. So if you find that you are um, not losing weight, but you are exercising, you are using fasting, you're using the complete intermittent fasting bundle, it could be that you're gaining muscle. If you're not exercising, you're probably not gaining muscle. So that is something that maybe it's one of these other factors um, to look into. All right, Monica, trying out Biochem. Oh, thank you for the super chat, Arena. I didn't see the original question, but Schnecki said, yes, you can use spirulina in your smoothies. Yes, you can use spirulina in your smoothies. <laughs> Okay, Sammy says, thank you for your hard work. Can you have MCT oil on a fast? Okay, so if you guys have been following me for a while, you probably know my answer on this one. Um, technically, yes, you can use MCT oil because it is just pure oil source. Um, it's something that a lot of people might use in their keto coffee instead of coconut oil. A lot of people like to use it because medium chain triglycerides, which is what MCT stands for, are a certain length of fats where it makes it so that the body doesn't have to package it the same way it does for other fats to get into the blood supply. So it actually can go and be used pretty much immediately as an energy source, which is why some people might notice a, a little bump in energy from using MCT oil. There are some great studies on it and like definitely a case to be made for MCT oil. My hesitation 
that again is not backed by any research. So don't take my word for this one. But my hesitation is that just historically speaking with nutrition, every time we highly, highly um, concentrate something that we wouldn't normally eat to that extent or get from nature to that extent or highly refine something to that extent, it's just things tend to go wrong. So my hesitation is let's see how it goes in like 10 years um, because you never know what's going to happen. This is a fairly new ingredient um, for most people to be using on such a frequent basis. So, you know, if, if you want to use it, sure. Like that's something that a lot of studies are showing do have some benefit, especially for weight loss and satiety purposes. But if you are on the skeptical side, like I am, you can always use coconut oil. It's not as dense in MCT as a pure MCT oil is, but it is a pretty significant source. Okay, uh, Brianna says, can you use Renfo to measure muscle mass? You can. So Renfo is another one of those at-home options. But like I mentioned, especially for these smaller changes in the beginning where you're not going to be seeing as big of changes, um, it's not necessarily going to show you that specific number. So, um, you know, it, it is a good option to just like our belief. That's the one I have. Um, it is a good option to have at home just to kind of like keep track of the trends and see what's going on. But if you want to see some of those more specific, like more accurate numbers, the in body is definitely the way to go. I mean, I wouldn't purchase one. I think the machine is like six or seven thousand dollars. Definitely go to your gym to use it. Okay, let me see. Um, another question on why some people eat lots of carbs and still do not put on any weight. This goes back to what I was saying on the insulin threshold. So I'd recommend just rewinding to that point um, because I go very much in detail on that. Which if anyone's just joining in right now, we're going over um, why someone might be eating healthy, exercising and not losing weight. So we've already gone over the fact that you might be having too many fake sugars, you know, a lot of like stevia or sugar alcohols um, that you might be eating beyond your personal carbohydrate threshold, which is where you got to see my beautiful hand drawn graph on here. Um, and then also that you could be gaining muscle. So let's go into the fourth one, which while I just take a sip of this, give me a thumbs up if you like this information so far. Okay. This fourth one is also surprisingly common too. Um, so it's just not enough time. <laughs> so this really comes back to insulin resistance as a big one. Like if you have a history of insulin resistance, you know, where you have those higher resting insulin levels. Um, I will get to that question in just one second. DC, thank you for the super chat. I will get to that question in just one second. So not enough time to actually allow the insulin levels to dip down. This is really common if you have insulin resistance, if the resting insulin level is really high from the constant secretion of insulin over years and years worth of time, the insulin level is now very high. Um, so it can take time for insulin levels to you know, bring itself back down to that normal level, bring itself back down to right here where it's then able to get in that fat burning area. Um, so especially if you have insulin resistance, it's not necessarily like all of a sudden that switch is going to be turned on as soon as you incorporate fasting. For If you don't have insulin resistance, that's likely what's going to happen where you see results a lot faster. But if you have a history of insulin resistance, that's where it can take a lot, quite a bit of time, you know, two, three, four weeks to actually start seeing progress because the insulin level, maybe it's over here fasting and it needs to make its way back over here until you start to see it go up. So this is something I've seen happen a lot um, with, uh, like I mentioned, people who have a history of insulin resistance or maybe didn't know they had a history of insulin resistance, but then went and got it tested and found out that they did. Uh, and this, the perfect hallmark of this is if you see that you had like, let's say a, um, like four weeks where you weren't losing weight and then all of a sudden you lose 10 pounds in like a week. That is very common if this is the issue where you are like over here, on the insulin resistance you know, uh, graph that you need to allow for your body to bring itself back down before it can go up. So this is where unfortunately just having patience with your body, allowing it to um, naturally start to get those insulin levels lower while working on the eating the types of foods and, and incorporating the types of practices that support that in the process. Okay, I saw the super chat back here. Are pre-workouts okay to use when fasting? Most of those have quite a bit of sugar or fake sugar in it. 
So probably not. Um, I have a whole blog post that I go more into the details of the specific types of pre-workouts, but a lot of those pre-workouts are going to be having some type of um, some type of like either sugar or uh, stevia or monk fruit to make it taste good. Um, but if you have to rely on that, I would just go for like the unsweetened options or the flavorless options. Um, I personally am just a big fan of uh, if you need to have some type of boost, just using coffee as your option or tea as your option. That way you're you're getting the caffeine, which is the main thing in pre-workouts. Um, but you also are getting at least the antioxidants to help buffer that too. So with both tea and coffee, that would be a really good option to use instead of a lot of the sugar filled pre-workout options. Okay, so I have one more um, main thing to go over here, but I want to answer a couple more questions. Um, can you drink the ACB sipper every day? As long as you don't have any type of health concern where it would be an issue, so like an ulcer, um, there shouldn't be a problem for having the ACB sipper every day as long as it's di diluted. Because there are, you know, there have been um, case studies where people don't dilute the apple cider vinegar and they drink like a cup and a half. I think there's one case study of like a 15 year old girl who um, was was drinking like a cup and a half of undiluted apple cider vinegar a day. And she had like tooth um, enamel um, loss and was getting a lot of just damage to her GI tract. You know, if you're having something diluted versus undiluted, it even changes the pH of the um, apple cider vinegar because you're now mixing it with something that is more alkaline. Um, so it's a lot different of having one to two tablespoons worth of apple cider vinegar diluted in water versus having massive amounts of undiluted apple cider vinegar. So make sure it's uh, diluted and make sure that you're um, not having a cup and a half worth of apple cider vinegar a day. Okay, good question. So um, should you lift before cardio? So the reason why um, you might want to lift, especially if you are looking for much larger muscle gains, the reason why, why you might want to lift before doing any type of cardio is because you want to make sure that your glycogen stores are tapped, tapped, <laughs> tapped off. Yeah. Ha you have the maximum amount of glycogen stores to have that more explosive type of workout that you're going to be doing with weight um, bearing exercises or with lifting. Um, so that's, that is a case for that, but I do generally recommend at least trying to get some type of walk in before obviously stretching, especially uh, just to help loosen up the muscles and get them ready to um, be incorporating, especially that amount of exercise. Elizabeth, hello from, oh, from Georgia, the country. Awesome. Okay, Jasmine, great question. So you're coming from calorie restriction and satiety comes with less amount of food. How do you make that switch to bigger volume of food with eating for macros? Um, for come. Okay, um, this is another one. I mentioned this in the last video. This really to, to give this topic justice. I want to do a, a whole video on this. I want to bring on a couple of those researchers I mentioned because you know my graph can only do so much. Um, but it, this is unfortunately just a huge, huge topic in nutrition on the idea of calorie restriction versus the actual hormonal response of weight loss and weight gain um, within the body. And there's so much that if you're in like the field, it just can seem so obvious and, and that the hormonal response um, has the biggest factor when it comes to weight loss and really the main and only factor for 99% of people. But it can be hard to translate at times, unfortunately, to a lot of people who aren't just immersed in this field. So I want to make sure I can do this justice so that I actually explain this very well. Um, so that you guys can understand this. So I will be doing a video in the future on the idea of like calorie restriction versus the hormonal response of weight loss. Um, and I want to do that in the future when I can bring on some um, researchers who are in that field to talk more about it as well. Okay, great question. So Lighthouse, hi Autumn, as a 46 year old woman, I'm concerned that hormone levels are also playing a role in weight loss failure. Your thoughts? Yeah, so 
especially the closer we get to menopause, um, the more insulin resistant we get. So remember, if you're more insulin resistant, then it requires even more insulin for your body to respond to the same amount of carbohydrates, which means that remember you um, goes back to this graph here. So you could, um, you know, the amount of, uh, let's say the amount of insulin you're producing to an apple might be the same amount that someone else is producing to a bowl of pasta. So even from an apple, you could be like all the way down here versus someone else who has a bowl of pasta and they don't have that high insulin resistance level and they could be at that same point. Um, so with women going through or starting to approach menopause, even just after pregnancy, this is a big thing because you get more insulin resist resistant during pregnancy as well as why type um, uh, gestational diabetes is so common with women um, during pregnancy. I think it's like one in every four women experience it, but it's because you get more insulin resistance or resistant during pregnancy. So especially if you've had kids or if you're approaching menopause, it's very common to see that a lot of people start to become more insulin resistant during that time. So that goes back to the second, um, the second just main point I made with this video on uh finding your personal carbohydrate threshold because it could change over time. So especially just for anyone, as anyone starts to get older, that threshold could be a lot lower as well. Um, so this is the advanced weight loss strategies. Like I mentioned in the complete intermittent fasting bundle gives more of a specific strategy and protocols to go about that. Um, but definitely the same thing that maybe worked for you at 17 might not work for you even at 29 because the body can start to get more insulin resistant as we age. Okay, great question. Brianna says, what are your thoughts on plant protein versus whey or whey isolate? Um, so one thing to consider about plant-based protein versus whey, if you are open to having um, an animal-based product, whey is going to be higher in essential amino acids and branching in amino acids. It's about, um, I know plant-based is about 85% lower in essential amino acids. Um, just it, it there's this whole field of sports nutrition really dives into the specifics on which one is going to be best for helping with muscle uh, synthesis or creating new muscle. Um, and definitely way uh, just dairy based proteins are some of the better ones. Um, so if you are going to be using that, just make sure that you're using a high quality option. There are still some great plant based options. So if you are solely plant based, you can still absolutely use plant based. Um, but if you are looking for maximum essential amino acids, maximum uh, branch chain amino acids, you want to go for more of the animal based options that will be pretty significantly higher. Uh, one other thing to note between the two is that unfortunately, a lot of the plant based protein powders are very high in heavy metals. So we've talked about this before in previous um, live streams and a couple of videos as well. I think I have a full video dedicated to this. Uh, but just because the soil um, where a lot of these different protein powders are pulled from tend to be in very polluted areas where it gets a lot of heavy metal exposure. So there's a consumer report study um, where I believe they do it every year and they test new batches of proteins and they consistently find that the plant based proteins are a lot higher in heavy metals. So if you want to be really safe and use a plant based option, you could always go with like a whole food source of a um, plant based protein. So you could use like hemp seeds instead. Um, you could use you know, if you aren't averse to using um, tofu, some people use that in their um, smoothies as well. Just please make sure you go for organic with that at the very least. Um, but there are other options if you want to try and avoid those that heavy metal exposure or at least check the latest consumer reports when you are choosing which protein powder you're going to have. Oh, Katie said, yes, the AWLS, so Advanced Weight Loss Strategy of the Level Up Guide um, really helps with insulin resistance and hormones for me. Cheers. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to the next one. So keep putting your questions in. I'm gonna go to the next one because um, this is something that is also very common. <laughs> um, getting poor sleep consistently. I cannot tell you how many of my clients um, will come to me and have very poor sleep, like every single night that they're not never feeling rested, never waking up and feeling rested. I'm sure probably a lot of you guys can feel the same way. Uh, let me know in the chat if you're one as well. I know that was me for a long time too. And that's why I could see how much of an effect that sleep had on not just weight loss goals. It definitely has a huge effect on weight loss goals, um, but also on mood and how you feel the next day. For myself personally, I noticed a huge spike in my anxiety levels the next day when I got poor sleep. Even just one night of poor sleep can have a huge spike in my anxiety levels. 
And it's likely because cortisol levels will go skyrocketing when you have poor sleep. It's really just because your body didn't get the rest that it needed. So it's trying to just bring that energy level up by producing cortisol to get your energy levels going for that day and make it through that day until you can get better sleep that night. So there's actually even been studies showing that just one night of poor sleep can negatively affect hormones by increasing um, the hunger hormone ghrelin, obviously increasing uh, cortisol levels as well. I believe I even saw that it can um, make you more insulin resistant the next day too. I'd have to double check that one, but certainly increases ghrelin, certainly increases cortisol levels. Um, so uh, since, you know, increased hunger, uh, especially with increased ghrelin, it can really increase sugar cravings as well. Plus the higher cortisol level, higher stress levels that also can increase sugar cravings and make it a lot harder to not give in to a lot of those um, insulin stimulating foods. So if at the end of the day, there's like ice cream in your site, you got poor sleep and maybe you, your day was moderately stressful it's going to be really hard for you not to give in to that ice cream that's there that will then further spike insulin um, and even make it harder to achieve the weight loss goals. Um, so obviously getting high quality sleep is something really important. I've done a lot of videos on, I might do a live stream on this one in the future as well, but some main strategies that you can do to help prioritize your sleep is probably the hardest one, probably the absolutely hardest one for a lot of people is to not have any technology before bed. And I mean like, minimum 30 minutes, but really an hour would be so much better if you could not watch TV, not be on your phone, you know, not scroll before bed. And I personally know I used to do this as well. Um, a few years back, probably like five years back, have my phone right next to me when I go to sleep and look at like Instagram right before bed. Um, so when you're looking at some type of light, some type of technology, it can signal to the brain that it's daytime and it doesn't need to produce melatonin which is some people say like, oh, I need the um, TV to fall asleep. I understand that was me like all of high school. I would play Back to the Future one every single night before bed because I thought that helped me go to sleep. But then I would like feel so tired the next day. Um, and even though it might help you fall asleep, you know, seem like it's this white noise, essentially, that light can inhibit the melatonin production and make it so that you either get poor quality sleep or you're waking up throughout the middle of the night multiple times. Um, so if you're in the habit of falling asleep to the TV, to your phone, um, to your laptop, whatever it might be, that's really the first main thing to address. And that in itself can make a huge difference. Um, some other ones. So very common ones, limiting your caffeine intake. Not one that we want to hear, especially for those who love keto coffee like I do. Like I could easily sip on keto coffee all day and be like a huge happy camper. But even if you don't think that you're affected by caffeine, and I'm talking to you guys who think that you don't, you aren't affected by caffeine, um, even if you don't think that you are and you think you can fall asleep right away, it still can affect the melatonin levels. So even though you are falling asleep quickly, even if you're able to fall asleep quickly, you could still have those suppressed melatonin levels, not get that high quality deep sleep and not get rested for the next day. So challenge you guys, try and not have any caffeine by, I'm going to say 2 p.m., but really 12 p.m. would be the goal. So you can really optimize for that sleep. I think the half-life, if I remember correctly, so how long it takes for caffeine to exit the system, I believe the half-life is six hours. I'm not positive on that, um, but really just the earlier that you can uh, keep your caffeine intake, the better, so that you're not disrupting your sleep later on. And then another one, so no sugar before bed. <laughs> It's a big one because sugar can really spike and fall those blood glucose levels. So when you have a big spike um, in blood glucose from having sugar, it can then cause insulin to go skyrocketing, quickly bring that back down and get it down below baseline where then cortisol needs to be pumped up and cortisol can directly inhibit melatonin. Um, so not having a lot of sugar before bed is also a really key strategy, especially those more dense sources of sugar that will cause insulin and uh, blood glucose to go spiking so that you don't get any of those issues with sleep. Plus, I'm sure you guys have probably seen like, you know, any kid when they um, after Halloween eat a bunch of candy and they have like the zoomies. You don't want that before bed. So another reason why. Um, and then a really big one. So allowing for if possible. So this is really an if possible one. These other ones I said before are like the main ones. But if possible, trying to aim for two hours before bed of no eating or drinking. So this just helps to stimulate the GI tract and allows for digestion to happen before you actually go to sleep. So if you go to sleep with, with too full of a belly and um, where you're going to bed really full from dinner, that can actually inhibit sleep as well. So if you don't have as much time, like let's say just purely because of your schedule, you have to eat 
you know, an hour or 30 minutes before bed and then go to bed right away, just because that's how your schedule is. At the very least, go for like a five minute walk just to help stimulate the GI tract a bit and get digestion going so that it could help at least with not interfering with your sleep quality. Oh, and then the last um, really great strategy for sleep is darkness. <laughs> so um, if you expose your eyes to darkness, to no light, in other words, this can also help to trigger to your body, let it know that melatonin needs to be produced. Um, so something that I'll do sometimes if I've been like more stimulated from something later in the evening where I know that I need to bring myself back down to go to sleep, I'll go on a walk around our, our neighborhood again, just for like that five to 10 minutes where there's no street lights. And just walk around and get my eyes adjusted to that darkness so that my body will just start to naturally produce melatonin. It's a really good little strategy that I use for myself, but also a lot of um, my clients have used that just to help improve sleep quality, especially if you find that you're like more stimulated at night. Um, and then, of course, wearing like an eye mask to cover your eyes when you sleep for even more darkness, making sure that you don't have lights on um, in your room uh, to help with that uh, darkness and melatonin production further. Okay, I want to answer a few more questions here. Need another sip of coffee. <laughs> uh, the Golden Roo said, what are your favorite organ meats? I wish <laughs> I could tell you that I liked them. I don't. So <laughs> I'm working on sneaking them into my meals, like in meatballs and stuff. I'll keep you updated on that, but I'm working on getting liver sneakily into my meals. Um, okay. So Nanette said, what do you think of those things that you breathe into that supposedly measures your metabolism? Do those really work? I mean, probably all they're really measuring is your ketone levels. I haven't looked too much into them, but there is one that you guys have probably seen a lot of ads for lately. Uh, but it looks to me like it might just be measuring your ketone levels to see if you're in fat burning or not. Um, but at that point, like, I don't know the cost of that one, but if you really wanted to get into the details of seeing if you are utilizing, um, creating ketones or not, which is the byproduct of burning fat as fuel, just go for the blood meters. So Keto Mojo is a really good one. So you could always just check that one out. Um, but you don't even really need that. You can use it if you want to, just to see where you're at. And if you're like really data driven, it could be helpful, um, but it's not necessary. Okay, great, great question. So Carol said, I sometimes listen to talk radio or podcast when I go to bed. Is that bad? Um, so since we have to think about like what's actually causing um, the, the melatonin to be decreased, and that's the light. Usually light is the biggest one. Um, there is some research that EMFs that are emitted from phones can actually be absorbed in the body the same way as light and also cause those issues. So if you're someone who falls asleep with your phone like right under your pillow, might want to experiment with putting it across the room. Um, but if you're listening to like a true radio, like off of a radio, probably not a problem. Um, or if you're listening to like a podcast or the radio from your phone, but it's across the room and you're not looking at your phone in the process also shouldn't be a problem. We use a, a white noise maker, like one of those ones you, you can get apps for this uh, probably for free. Um, but we use one that's just right next to our bed and it doesn't, uh, require us to be looking at a phone or something to turn it on. <laughs> Robert says, my mom tricked me into eating liver by calling it side steak. Did it work? Tell me. <laughs> um, if you are consuming, okay, so Ramey said, if you are consuming higher quantities of protein and medium amounts of fats, can that still put you into ketosis? It depends on what you consider high and medium. So you know, high could be for some people, 20% of your intake from um, protein. That still should likely be fine. Again, it can depend also on each person's insulin resistance. I mentioned this earlier, but Bickman, that one researcher um, has done some really interesting research in the past of protein levels related to like your insulin level. So if you don't have like a really high resting insulin level or higher insulin at that time, then that protein um, shouldn't inhibit ketosis. Whereas if you do have a lower if you have higher amounts of insulin, then that protein could inhibit ketosis just regardless. Um, so Bickman is really a great researcher if you want to look more into that research. Um, but original question, it depends on how much protein you consider to be high. I mean, I wouldn't consider 
high, like truly high intakes of protein, which is like, you know, above 30% of your intake. Um, I wouldn't even consider that something that you'd want to do because naturally those meats wouldn't have 30% of your intake coming from um, protein. A, a lot of fat is actually naturally in protein, which we have to consider. There's a reason for that. Um, so you still want to be eating enough fat to balance out that protein. If not, it could lead to something called rabbit starvation, which can cause diarrhea, a lot of unpleasantness. So you don't want to have too much protein in relation to fat. If you're eating like regular protein sources and not just a ton of protein powder where it's void of any fat anyway, then you shouldn't ever probably get to issues with that level. Um, especially, you know, if you already have kidney disease and you definitely want a much lower intake of protein. Um, but, but, uh, totally lost my train of thought there, but anyway, so for that protein, you just want to make sure that you're not having like just isolated forms of protein that will get protein levels way too high and counterbalance all of the fat that you should be having along with that protein to prevent something called rabbit starvation. Um, okay. Uh, so Samar said, how much protein, fat, carbs do you recommend in terms of percentages? Um, I rarely recommend actually looking at fat and carbohydrates in terms of like actually calculating those um, because that goes back to a lot of like macro counting, calorie counting, which is something that I've not seen very successful for the long term. But one thing that you can do, especially if you are more data driven and you want to calculate a little bit more is the protein. So I do have a video a live stream and a shortened version where it's like three minutes on how you can calculate your protein needs. That's one where you could actually start to go back and calculate your protein needs um, and start building your meals around that. Uh, so Liza asks, is IF safe for an underweight, for, un for underweight women? Um, it depends. If there's eating disorders involved, then really any type of restriction shouldn't be advised as you know, you first need to address the emotional aspect, the food aspect. Um, if it's an eating disorder case, if not, uh, you know, it's not necessarily that intermittent fasting is a form of calorie restriction. We've talked about this so much and it's in the complete intermittent fasting bundle that I developed for the exact reason. It's meant to help make sure that your body can have a period of time where you're utilizing fat as fuel and have a period of time where you're breaking down energy and storing it. Um, rather than just doing that all day where you're just constantly storing. So with intermittent fasting, it's remember, it's not necessarily eating less, it's eating less often. So this is where I never recommend eating less for your needs during that eating window, just making sure that you're actually tailoring your meals to fit your needs. So um, this is where if you are someone who is underweight, maybe you would want to incorporate a little bit more starches to bring the insulin level a little bit higher during that eating window to help make sure that you can gain back weight if that's what you're looking for. Um, so remember, intermittent fasting, not necessarily form of calorie restriction can be used that way, but it's not something that I would personally advise because it's not really addressing the true cause of weight loss or weight gain anyway. Um, so Camilla asked, what about stevia and protein powder? I went over this one. Um, if you go back about like, I think like 30 minutes ago, um, I go into that one in a little bit more detail. Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. So Shay said, would you consider doing more what I eat in a day videos? I would. They're really fun. <laughs> um, so if you guys want them, I definitely will. Okay, I'm going to answer a couple more questions here. I want to scroll back, see if I missed any while I was ranting. Okay, great question. So how does collagen affect you and do you use it? I'm not sure if you're referring to in response to intermittent fasting or just like general health. So collagen is not a complete protein. First things first to remember. Um, so it's not something that you want to swap from just regular protein sources because you won't get a complete source of protein from collagen, but it is a great option to just help um, supplement your, your meals. So it's a, you know, there's a lot of research on um, collagen improving um, like joint motility and uh, decreasing inflammation in the joints as well. So there is definitely a time and place for using collagen. Um, and there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence of people saying that they've noticed such a really great um, improvements in their skin. Um, I usually use it in my smoothies. That's usually when I'll add it in. Um, I haven't been taking as much because I've been using bone broth. So bone broth is a really rich source of collagen just naturally from the bones. And I'll use that in a lot of my meals. Um, but you know, I, I switch back and forth between using those. If it's in response to fasting, like, can you have it during fasting period? 
Collagen is still amino acid, so it still can cause an insulin response. So it's something you would want to keep during your eating window. Robert says, I love liver. Okay, I'll take your word for it. I'll try it. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, <laughs> Tiffany, thoughts on melatonin supplements? I don't usually recommend them. <laughs> um, it, you know, there can also be time and place for melatonin supplements, especially if you're traveling to help quickly get you acclimated. There's like a whole protocol you can use melatonin and getting acclimated to the local environment. Um, but melatonin is something that we naturally produce. So whenever there's something we naturally produce, I try not to incorporate it in because you always run the risk of your body not producing it as much or not giving your body the amount that it needs because it is something that our body will naturally give us the amounts we need. So I usually, I don't take it. Um, a lot of my clients don't take it. It can be something that can be used properly, but you know, it's hit or miss. Okay. Let me scroll down to the bottom now. Yeah. Bone broth broccoli soup was superb. That's something from the uh, seven day I detox in the bundle, which link down in the description below the bone broth broccoli soup. Yeah. I also shared um, that. I think it was in my more recent, what I eat in a day video, really great classic one. A lot of kids love that. So if um, you have trouble getting like vegetables in your kid's diet or protein, which also can be surprisingly hard to get that into, you can sneak some of those in with soups, especially with the bone or the, uh, the broccoli soup. Amazing. <laughs> okay. So Billy said advice for young women looking to lose that last four to five pounds um, that just don't go away or your body goes back to your start weight after taking a break from doing IF. Sounds like if you have a, a break from doing IF that you might not be actually addressing your meals. Um, something that a huge common mistake I see is people don't actually look into the types of foods they're eating with intermittent fasting and just treat intermittent fasting as a form of calorie restriction, which then just brings intermittent fasting back to the same issues that calorie restriction has of this yo-yoing effect. Cause there's only so long your body can be in a state of semi-starvation before you need to eat again. So it's not sustainable. Um, so, you know, check out, um, a lot of my other videos and also check out for more of the step-by-step -step details, um, complete intermittent fasting bundle listed down in the description below where it actually addresses your meals too. But you want to make sure that your meals actually try and mimic a lot of what's happening with your, um, fasting window. So of keeping insulin on the lower side. So that's something where you can check out, like I mentioned for more step-by-step -step strategies, um, have in the complete intermittent fasting bundle link down below, or, you know, a lot of my videos too go into this. Tiffany, thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. The golden root broccoli does not like me. That's okay. You don't have to eat broccoli, but if broccoli works for you, broccoli soup is great. So Anna said thoughts on grass-fed whey, protein powder versus collagen. Same issues that they're not really comparable because collagen isn't a complete protein. So if you're looking between one or the other, you at least need to use the um, the complete protein source, which would be the way in this circumstance and seeing collagen more as like a supplement and add on to get those added perks. Okay, I'm going to ask like one or two more questions. Um, okay, so Nicola, if you just joined in, welcome. Um, I come from an environment where I've been told to eat before and after a workout. If I work out during my fasted period, what then? Let me take a sip of coffee before this one. Okay. <clears throat> so first of all, it depends type of exercise you're doing. If it's high intensity interval training, you probably do want that during your eating window because that is something where you're going to be really running through your glycogen. So you want to make sure it's fully tapped off. Um, so during your eating window is really the best time to be doing like heavy sprint training. This is, this is really mostly just for like the athlete area. So if you are pushing yourself to that extreme, um, with high intensity interval training with the short distance sprints, um, with the power lifting where you really need to make sure you have enough glycogen, that's where during the eating window would be a good idea. Um, but if you are more of like a casual athlete, um, or just looking to get fit, then you don't necessarily need to be eating, but right before and right after your workout, especially if you're working out in your fasted state where you naturally have higher levels of, of uh, growth hormone. Most people do during that fasted state. 
It's just a consequence of when we are fasting, growth hormone tends to go up. Growth hormone protects the muscles from breakdown, which means that you can incorporate that exercise without having to worry about it necessarily being like broken down um, during that fasted state. And then making sure that you're getting adequate amounts of protein uh, during that recovery period, during your eating window after your workout. So of course, this will vary depending on each person, but those are like general guidelines, high intensity interval training during the eating window, especially if you're an athlete, um, but using more of the any other type of exercise, especially if you are interested in running your cardio, that's actually the best time to be doing it is during that um, when you're more fat adaptive during that fasting state, because the body is using that really great stable energy source of fat from that increased lipolysis, that increased fat burning. Great question. Um, I do, I did a whole live stream on this one as well back in like January for the January new year challenge. So if you look up, I think it's like intermittent fasting and exercise, what I titled it. And I go into so much detail on this, but it is a really interesting field. So um, Nicola, great question, but definitely if that doesn't answer it in, in enough detail for you, check that out. Yeah. So David said, I always run better fasted, especially. So it's once you're at that fat adaptive state. So make sure that you are easing into the process, that you're not jumping straight into it. You're avoiding a lot of those fasting mistakes that we talk about on this channel and in the complete intermittent fasting bundle. Um, but it is something where it is a really great steady source of energy for when you are doing something that is at the, like moderate, um, moderate to lower intensity anyway. Okay, I'm gonna answer one more question. Actually, quick question, then maybe one more. Uh, Brittany says, are hemp seeds a complete protein source? They are, but you need a lot of hemp seeds. So it is a good way to help bump it up, um, but it's not necessarily the one where you wanna only rely on it because it is um, fairly lower. It still is a complete protein, but it's fairly lower. And I forget the exact amount. I think you'd need like eight tablespoons, nine tablespoons or something to get one full meal's worth of protein. Oh, great. So Stasa says, I've taken your advice and increased my protein and fat during that time of the month and during stressful times to counter my cortisol and sweet tooth. It really works. Thank you. Cheers. Congratulations. That's awesome. So Shay said, thank you so much, Autumn. I've been following you for a year and using all of your recipes and I've lost 12 pounds. I feel like a new person. Um, every one of those, I, every one of those pounds to you. Congratulations, Shay. That's amazing. Hmm. Danielle, interesting question. Um, so Danielle, or yeah, Danielle said, I just read vitamins cause weight gain. If you're eating like the goalie gummy vitamins. <laughs> yeah. Um, so another big question I will see is people asking about the very trendy, very expensive goalie apple cider vinegar vitamins. Um, really any of these gummy vitamins are surprisingly high in sugar. So like, even if you just had one serving of them, like you're just having the goalie apple cider vinegar um, gummy vitamins a day, then get something like six grams of um, sugar per serving. If, especially if you're very carbohydrate sensitive, where your threshold is a lot lower, that in itself could put you over the edge because it is a simple form of sugar. Um, but if you're someone where maybe you aren't as carbohydrate sensitive, but you are using multiple different types of vitamins that are in the gummy form. So let's say you're taking like a multivitamin, a um, the apple cider vinegar, a vitamin D vitamin, you know, you have a multiple source of these gummy vitamins, each one that's going to be around six to eight grams of sugar each serving, that adds up. That's like 24, 30 grams of sugar just from that. And that's, you know, just like the, um, you know, like vanilla lattes that I harp on often <laughs> in a lot of my earlier videos, you know, that's like a vanilla latte is like 30 grams of sugar. So it can really add up. So especially if you're having those gummy vitamins, you know, that's a significantly higher source of sugar than you might expect. Maria, hi from New York. Okay. Um, so this is, like I mentioned, this is the last live stream for the um, spring intermittent fasting challenge. That we're in the fourth week of the spring intermittent fasting challenge right now. So much amazing Facebook group action. Um, if you guys are in it and you're in the challenge, you've seen just how much great support system there is um, in the uh, Autumn Nutrition private Facebook group. It's been amazing just to see how many connections are made and, and support systems are going on. So like I mentioned, this is the last one for right now. Um, and we will be going back to weekly for the summer challenge 
which lots of exciting things going on for that. If you aren't subscribed to my newsletter, it's free. Just check it out in the description down below. It's just like once a week. I don't spam you. Um, just to keep you in the loop for these upcoming challenges. But I have so many really exciting things coming up for the summer challenge that I've been planning for like the last year. Um, so make sure you're subscribed there so you can check out the details. And I'll be going back to weekly live streams during that challenge with a lot of really fun stuff. Um, I will be doing another live challenge uh, monthly leading up to then. So one in May and one in June. Um, but remember, just let me know what you guys want to actually see and talk about. I never plan anything until I hear back from you guys because uh, there's no point in me talking about stuff if you guys don't want to hear about it. So make sure you let me know in the comments below this video what it is that you actually want to hear about next time um, for the May live stream. But this is the last weekly one for right now just until the summer one, and then we'll go back to weekly. Um, the next one will be announced probably in the next couple of weeks. So make sure you let me know what you want to hear about. But otherwise, Keto Coffee Cheers, guys. Very well done for the last three weeks now of the challenge. You guys have been killing it, been really prioritizing your health and wellness, and it's showing. It's paying off. You guys are feeling so much better, and I'm really proud of each and every one of you. So Keto Coffee Cheers. Make sure to let me know what you guys want to see and hear about in the next live stream that will be in May. But cheers to last week of the spring intermittent fasting challenge. How was it April? <laughs> All right, guys. Well, cheers. And I will see you guys very soon. Thanks for tuning in.